Thanks for joining us for another Contagion Coronavirus video. Today we're joined by Dr. Matt Davis and we'll be talking about a presentation that he gave on behalf of SIDP regarding remdesivir. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. So can you discuss the mechanism of action of remdesivir? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so remdesivir is, uh, is, is a nucleoside analog. Um, it's uh, works through inhibiting viral replication through competitively inhibiting viral RNA polymerase, uh, kind of similar to acyclovir and gancyclovir. Um, the, the interesting thing about remdesivir is that it has this uh, phosphoramidate attachment to the ribose ring, um, which is essentially a nice way to deliver a uh, monophosphorylated nucleoside analog intracellularly. Um, once it's inside the cell, the phosphoramidate is cleaved by esterases, to the monophosphate form, which uh, then is subsequently phosphorylated to the triphosphate compounds, which is the pharmacologically active version. Um, so it, it is a nice way to kind of circumvent the rate limiting phosphorylation step that we see with, you know, gancyclovir and acyclovir and the other nucleoside analogs. So let's talk about pharmacokinetics. What do we know so far? Yeah, um, that's, that's a great question. So remdesivir PK is a little bit tricky because um, we really are tracking uh, the, the concentrations of a number of different metabolites. So the remdesivir compound itself, um, the, the prodrug phosphoramidate compound, um, the concentration of that doesn't really matter all that much. Um, it has a very rapid clearance from the plasma um, because once it enters the cell, it's rapidly converted by esterases to, uh, to the various nucleoside metabolites. Um, the thing that we actually care about the most is the uh, pharmacologically active triphosphate form um, and the intracellular concentrations of that one. Um, so it has a relatively long half-life um, intracellularly. It's about 11 hours. Um, so that's sufficiently long enough to allow for once daily dosing. Uh, there's a second nucleoside metabolite that we look at, um, which is the dephosphorylated form, um, which has an, a really long half-life as well, about 20 to 25 hours. Um, so that allows us to, to administer remdesivir as once daily dosing. From a metabolism standpoint, like I said, the, the prodrug is cleaved by intracellular esterases. Um, and then from an elimination standpoint, it's partially excreted um, renally and then also hepatobiliary. So safety is obviously really important. Um, so looking at the data that we have right now, what do we know about safety? Yeah, that's, um, that's a great question. Um, I think we need a little bit more data uh, before we can make a final judgment call on safety of remdesivir. Um, so far in the preclinical studies, it seems to be generally well tolerated. The most notable adverse event that has been reported is obviously transaminitis, um, which has led to you know, the exclusion criteria and the, the ongoing clinical trials with transaminase values. Uh, seems to be generally mild to grade one, grade two transaminase elevations, um, and then also self-limiting. Uh, the resolution usually occurs, you know, days to weeks after cessation of therapy. Uh, other adverse events that have been reported, um, kind of what we would normally expect in any clinical trial or any studies is, you know, just GI intolerances. Uh, it is intravenous, so there is some uh, proportion of patients who experience phlebitis, um, but all in all, so far, it seems to be generally well tolerated. So I know that remdesivir has been studied for other viruses. Um, so can you summarize a little bit about what we know about the activity against these other viruses it's been looked at for? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, there's been a lot of interest looking at uh, remdesivir's activity for a, a number of different uh, RNA viral families. Um, and, you know, Pretty, pretty much across the board um, from what it's been studied in, uh, it seems to have relatively high in vitro potency um, for uh, some notable viruses like Ebola, some of the, the pneumoviruses like RSV and human metanumovirus, um, and also the human and zoonotic coronaviruses. Um, one thing I, I do want to, uh, to make sure that the audience remains cognizant of is you know, this is all in vitro potency data, and uh, it's really important that we operate with a, with a healthy dose of skepticism because this is not necessarily translatable to clinical efficacy. Um, you know, kind of what we've seen historically for hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine uh, in a number of different viruses uh, leading up to SARS-CoV-2 is that, 
you know, there can be a disconnect between in vitro potency and also uh, clinical uh, efficacy. So um, it's just, it's important to know that although remdesivir does seem to have very uh, potent in vitro activity, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be successful in treating disease. So you mentioned Ebola, and I know that remdesivir was evaluated in a study in the DRC for Ebola. So what happened in that uh, trial? Yeah, that's the, that's the million dollar question, right? Um, so just briefly for the audience, um, there, was a, there was a trial conducted in the DRC in 2018 during the Ebola outbreak. Um, it was a forearm study, so um, it was an active comparator trial. Um, ZMAP, which was a triple monoclonal, uh, that had previously been studied um, in, in the treatment of Ebola, uh, served as the active comparator. Uh, remdesivir was one of the included arms, and then there were two additional treatment arms. Uh, one was an, an alternative triple monoclonal, uh, and then one was a single monoclonal that was uh, harvested from an Ebola survivor. Um, the, the, the trial was structured, it was a, you know, equal enrollment in each of the four arms. Uh, patients were stratified at baseline by viral load. Um, and they studied a primary endpoint of 28-day mortality. Um, when, when the trial was actually conducted, um, they, they con conducted a, an interim analysis and they found a pretty significant signal um, that uh, there was increased mortality in both the ZMAP and the remdesivir arms. So uh, these two arms had around a 50 to 53% mortality rate compared to the, uh, the other two options, um, which were around 29 to 33. So, a pretty big split, um, and so they decided to stop enrolling patients in those two arms because of you know the significant difference in mortality. Um, it it kind of left a lot of people scratching their heads because uh, in the prevail study leading up to this trial, um, ZMAP had a, a much lower mortality rate, around twenty two percent, and then also in the the animal data and the in vitro data uh, for remdesivir, the uh, it, it seemed to be a, a really promising agent, and so. Uh, having mortality rate around 50 to 53 percent was uh, was very unexpected and, and uh, underwhelming. Um, so, the the couple of points from from that study, uh, the baseline characteristics in each of the arms were were relatively well matched. Uh, however, there was a, a numerically higher uh, serum creatinine LT values um, in the remdesivir and ZMAP arms. Um, so that could potentially be a signal that. Um, maybe these patients were sicker at baseline. They are manifesting uh, end organ effects of Ebola. Um, another thing that the authors mentioned in the discussion was that both the, the two arms that performed really well, uh, the triple monoclonal and the single monoclonal, uh, they were administered as a single daily dose, like just a one, one treatment dose, and that was a full course, whereas both ZMAP and remdesivir um, required multiple infusions to get the whole treatment course. Um, and in a, in a disease that progresses as rapidly as, you know, Ebola, um, that might have had uh, some effects on the overall outcomes of the trial. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, ZMAP and remdesivir didn't perform anywhere near as well as we were, we were hoping, uh, hoping them to perform. So. Thank you. So now that we've kind of worked our way through what we know already, why don't we just get into what we're seeing right now with COVID-19? So can you talk a little about how remdesivir is being evaluated right now? Yeah, it's, um, there's, there's several ongoing clinical trials right now. Uh, it's, a little, it's actually a little difficult to keep track of you know, everything that's, that's going on for remdesivir. Um, on the, in the United States, there are a few uh, clinical trials. Um, there's the adaptive study. Uh, which is which is being sponsored by the NIAID, um, which is structured initially as a placebo-controlled trial, remdesivir uh, being administered for 10 days. Um, and the intent of this study, uh, if there is a you know good enough signal for efficacy and safety, um, is to shift from this initial placebo-controlled uh, methodology to an active comparator with remdesivir serving as the active control and comparing it to other antivirals for for COVID. Um, so that's one study. Uh, Gilead, the manufacturer of remdesivir, is sponsoring two different studies, one for severe disease and then another for mild to moderate disease. And they're really trying to figure out what the optimal duration of therapy is. Um, they're comparing five days versus 10 days. Um, there is the, um, there's a few ongoing clinical trials in, uh, in China right now, one for severe disease and then one also for mild to moderate disease as well. 
And then there's a couple of international studies. Um, so there's this, the Solidarity Trial, which is uh, sponsored by the WHO. And that's going to be uh, currently it's remdesivir versus hydroxychloroquine um, versus standard of care. Uh, and then there's also the Discovery Trial, which is a multinational trial um, being conducted in Europe, um, which is sponsored by INSERM, the, the French Institute of Research. Um, and that's actually a four-arm, uh, four-arm or four-active arm study, um, which remdesivir is one of those arms. Uh, and then there's also a standard of care arm as well. So a number of ongoing clinical trials uh, currently, um, hoping to see some at least preliminary results, maybe uh, by the end of May. Um, or maybe even a little earlier, uh, but yeah, there's definitely a lot kind of going on right now. Absolutely. Uh, so my next question for you is actually one that was submitted by a Contagion reader, and that person asked, how is Gilead providing access to remdesivir for clinicians within the U.S.? Yeah, so um, <laughs> that, that's another great question, and it's, uh, it's, it seems like the answer is rapidly changing. Um, so probably by the time this video goes live, there's going to be some new information. Um, uh, historically, uh, there was the compassionate use uh, uh, option for patients who were not in, eligible for clinical trials. Um, because of just the global demand uh, for remdesivir currently, um, Gilead has... Uh, essentially shut down their compassionate use um, portal um, and they're only accepting new requests for patients who are pregnant um, or patients who are uh, less than the age of 18 years old with a severe disease um, because those two patient groups are excluded from the ongoing clinical trials. They're transitioning uh, compassionate use access to this expanded access program um, and the, the protocol is now live on clinicaltrials.gov um, there's, I think, seven enrolling sites already, um, and they are going to be uh, assessing eligibility for um, enrollment in, as a site for the Expand Access Program based off a couple of criteria. Um, really, it's going to come down to whether or not you can access remdesivir through other means, so enrollment in clinical trials. Um, the, the surge of your, of your local area um, and kind of your overall burden of COVID cases um, the local reach of your institution, and then also regulatory compliance. But yeah, um, this is kind of rapidly changing. Um, so I think I would, I would, I'd like to direct the audience just to the, the rdbcu.gilead.com website, which is their compassionate use portal, uh, for probably the most updated information, or also clinicaltrials.gov. Thank you. So my last question for you is, what are your tips for staying engaged and informed in the face of a pandemic? <laughs> um, that one's really tough to figure out. Um, I think, so a couple of strategies that we've been doing over at UCLA, uh, so myself and a few of our ID physicians um, are doing this somewhat of a round robin journal club where you know, we, have a, we have a literature team basically and um, you know, each couple of days we'll take turns uh, just getting one of the newest articles that comes out and just doing a deep dive into the methodology, the results, um, you know, kind of the, the limitations um, and then providing a summary to our, our division at large. Um, so that's, that's one way that we're trying to stay on top of the literature. Um, it's essentially just drinking from a fire hose. You're, you're, there's new studies coming out constantly. There's new agents being recommended. Um, so just, I think, uh, getting a group of people that you trust um, and just, you know, trying to do deep dives um, and then also acknowledging the fact that no single person can read every single thing that's coming out. So you really do need a team of folks uh, around you kind of doing, doing literature evaluation as well. Um, that's, that's one aspect we're, we're, uh, we're taking at, or that's one um, avenue we're doing uh, at, at UCLA. Um, another thing is just basically reading anything that Aaron McCurry and Jason Pogue put out, uh, tweets, review articles, um, looking at SIDP, um, you know, a lot of great summary material, um, all the webinars and, and, and videos. Um, I think that those are kind of the, the strategies that, that we've been taking. Those are great. Thank you so much. Um, so thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your overview of remdesivir and your helpful tips. Uh, for anyone that's interested in viewing Dr. Davis's presentation, you can do so on the SIDP website, and a link is included below this video. Thanks for having me. Anytime.